About a month ago, I made a video discussing some of the worst kings of the Seven Kingdoms. Almost half of the rulers have been terrible, and that doesn't necessarily mean the other half were good for the realm. There's some I put in a neutral category. So I'll leave the embarrassment led by the Mad King, who was the worst of them with a red border around the image, and the good dudes with green around them. Neutral guys will stay in grayscale. The first king, Aegon the Conqueror, who united the Seven Kingdoms for the first time is remembered as a great ruler. Kind of the gold standard for Targaryens. The perfect combination of admired and feared. But he was a conqueror. It's literally in his name. So you gotta ask, why start a continent-wide war to put a crown on top of his head? Was it worth the sacrifices to unite the kingdoms? I don't think there's a definite yes or no here, but the pros do slightly outweigh the cons. Let's look at what was going on in this world 300 years back. The most powerful family in the world, the Targaryens, were the last of the Dragon Lords, but were isolated on a laughably small island called Dragonstone. The island and its castle was set up to only be an outpost, so not the most ideal location, especially considering how dreary the place is. Just a short ways away on the shores of the continent, war was waging. King Harrenhor ruled over both the Iron Islands and the Riverlands. Just a couple generations back, his family became the first to conquer both of these kingdoms, becoming kings of the Isles and Rivers. Heron was pure evil and quickly gaining power. This worried the neighboring king of the Stormlands, whose power was dwindling. So he turned to Aegon for support, but in a very deceptive way. The Storm King offered his daughter's hand in marriage, and in return, he promised Aegon some lands. But they didn't belong to him. The lands he offered belonged to King Harrenhor so a very passive way of asking for defense against a potential invasion. With Aegon already married to both of his sisters, he offered his base-born half-brother instead. A betrothal proposal to a bastard was seen as an insult in the Storm King's eyes, so retaliated by having the messenger's hands cut off and sent back to Aegon. This act set Aegon off to his conquest. These other men were not worthy of holding the title of king in his eyes. Every previous monarch was either defeated or bent the knee in a matter of two years. All except Dorne. They were a lot more tricky to deal with and defiant. Aegon left with no choice other than to agree to peace terms with Dorne, focus on building a relationship with each of the other kingdom's people and rulers that he now controlled. And he really took his time doing this. For almost the entirety of his long rule, he spent half of each year on the road in something called a royal progression, kind of like a tour. This really solidified their relationship with the Targaryens. He was careful to not be a tyrant. You would expect a king's subjects to convert beliefs. Instead, the Targaryens adopted to the prominent religion here, the Faith of the Seven, abandoning the Valyrian gods. He was fine with letting his lords keep all their traditions and customs and strived for peace. The last 20 years of his reign is remembered as the Dragon's Peace. With the majority of the lords freeing the hell out of their dragons, fights between rival houses dropped pretty dramatically. Because of this, I think the good he brought slightly outweighs the lives lost in his conquest. But objectively the best king of the Seven Kingdoms was Aegon's grandson, King Jaehaerys. It really isn't a debate, especially after the Targaryen's lore book, Fire and Blood, came out a few years back. Really drilling it into our heads how much he did during his insanely long reign so long that one of his nicknames became the Old King. But he was mostly referred to as the Conciliator for how well he handled troubling conflicts. His father and his uncle, the two kings before him, who almost ruined everything Aegon built, taught Jaehaerys everything he needed to know in order to avoid an uprising against Targaryens. His deceased father, King Aenys, was far too weak and indecisive, while his uncle Maegor far too cruel. Jaehaerys had to be forgiving towards their many enemies, but also stern. He needed to be feared just a little. At age 14, he was crowned king, and even then he was wise enough to realize his flaws. He needed to appear stronger and more skilled to inspire loyalty, so worked his ass off in the training yards to become a better fighter. By the time he was of age to rule with a regent, Jaehaerys was a complete package, a perfect ruler. During his 55-year reign as king, he worked tirelessly to make the realm a flourishing economy and a more comfortable and peaceful place. Taxes he implemented didn't affect the less fortunate and wouldn't anger the rich that much. He formed a small council to help rule over areas he wasn't all that experienced with, connected the Seven Kingdoms with the King's Road, 
His strong sense of justice and swift action made this time period the most stable and prosperous for the realm. It would be a little while for the Seven Kingdoms to have another king sit on the Iron Throne that I consider to be good. 68 years, actually. Ironically enough, it would be a man known for his madness to bring true peace back. King Baelor, nicknamed the Blessed, was a religious zealot. He was as hardcore as it gets, but that doesn't always have to be a bad thing. Proven by our pal Baelor over here. He was crowned when he was 17, after his older brother Darren died trying to finally conquer Dorne. Darren, the young dragon, is seen as a great ruler by some and mad by others. I just see this character as a teenager eager for glory, so neutral. All he really did was reignite an old war, losing tens of thousands of lives with no success. As soon as Baelor was coronated, he made it a priority to restore peace with the Dornish. Both sides held hostages, and everyone expected the Dornish hostages to be killed in King's Landing after the young dragon was ambushed and killed. Instead, the pious Baelor let them all go and decided to walk to Dorne to free his cousin, who was being held captive over there. And when I say walk, that means going through the scorching desert barefoot, while the newly freed highborn hostages rode on horseback. On his painful journey, Baelor came across his cousin Aemon the Dragon Knight, encaged. He was captured trying to defend King Darren, but there was nothing he could do for his cousin without the key. So he continued onward to speak with the Prince of Dorne, and promised his cousin to return and free him. The gesture of walking across a continent to personally forgive his brother's killers left an impact on the Prince of Dorne. They arranged two marriages between House Martell and Targaryen that would finally bring Dorne under the realm, and without bloodshed. The people began to view Baelor as a miracle worker, while Baelor believed he had some deep connection and dialogue with the gods. Not only did he survive the barefoot trek, but when given the key to Aemon's cage to free him, it was now placed above a pit of vipers. The Prince of Dorne tried his best to ensure no harm would come to Baelor, but Aemon the Dragon Knight's captures had other plans. Baelor believed the gods would protect him and walked into the pit to free his cousin, and of course, he was bit over and over again. But he did manage to reach the cage and unlock it before passing out. It took months, but he did recover from the snake bites. He then began claiming to have visions. Baylor saw a great sep that would be built on top of Visenya's hill, a sep that he had seen in a vision. People would constantly question his decisions, but he would only listen to the High Septon. He would regularly empty King's Landing's treasury to help out the poor. He also attempted to provide tax exemptions for those who ensured the virtue of their daughter by actually using chastity belts. His strange decisions only got dangerous when he began burning books. It wasn't long before he was spending an alarming amount of time praying and fasting. After the High Septon, who influenced a lot of his decisions, died, he had another vision of who should replace him. And this is where his sanity really starts being questioned. He convinced people to elect a random guy who couldn't read or write or even recite a prayer. This guy, who became the new High Septon, quickly died of a fever. Baylor claimed to have seen an 8-year-old boy speaking with doves that answered back to him in the voices of the Seven. This kid became the next High Septon. During a 41-day fast, he finally went too far and ended up killing himself after a 10-year reign. While he might have been nuts, his good deeds overshadow that. Even in the current story, he's remembered as the Beloved. Since he was a pious man, he didn't want to be ruled by his lusts. Baylor never had children with his sister wife, didn't even consummate the marriage. So his uncle, Viserys, who had been Hand of the King for three different rulers, was next to sit on the Iron Throne. And he was a great king, without any asterisks characterizing his madness. He went to work making revisions of older laws, and making reforms where appropriate but then suddenly died a year into his reign. He was an older man, being crowned at 49, but healthy, leading some to suspect his eldest son and heir, who had his eye on the Iron Throne, may have been responsible. His horrible reign to come backs this argument. He ended what was looked at as a continuation of King Jaehaerys' legacy. Viserys' grandson, Darren II, would be the next good king. And if you're wondering why, it's cause his epithet was Darren the Good. What else would you need to know? Next. But in all seriousness, he had a lot of damage that needed repairing in the realm because of his piece of shit father, who was terribly corrupt. His father did everything he could to illegitimize his own son's claim to the Iron Throne, out of spite, which sparked rebellions Darren and the future kings had to deal with. And he did so efficiently. Darren cut out the cancer brought to court, seeking to take advantage of the crown's treasury restoring stability back to the realm. 
He wasn't the most skilled on the battlefield, but his book smarts made up for it. After a 25-year reign, King Darren II died to the Great Spring Sickness, a plague that hit his family pretty hard. Two of the more forgettable kings would follow him, until his grandson, Aegon V, came into power. The only character in the story to have a series of short stories chronicling his life. Aegon, mostly called Egg for short, is a pretty difficult king to rank on this list. He spent his entire childhood traveling the Seven Kingdoms as a squire, being amongst the small folk. He was the only king to truly understand the needs of the common man, and dedicated his work to looking after them, whether it be changing some laws, taking away some power from lords over their subjects, or providing more than what the highborns would like to have seen given to commoners. Like in the case of a brutal winter, where many northerners usually would starve, Aegon made sure aid was sent, angering some who believed too much was provided, taking away from others. Nothing came easy for Aegon. He was constantly challenged, but paid no mind to the lords at court. They already had more than any man should, so he believed the weak should have all his attention. The very beginning of his reign even started with turbulence. His cousin, the previous hand of the king, Brennan Rivers, who we all know as a three-eyed raven, executed a pretty heinous plot moments before Aegon was crowned. Brendan invited a potential rebel to the Red Keep under the promise of safe conduct, but then had him killed. The 33-year-old Egg's first act as king was to bring justice for Brendan's deceit. Even though he was family, Egg sentenced his cousin to death, but allowed him to join the Night's Watch if he so choose. And that's what he did. Egg had to prove that those type of promises made by the Iron Throne have worth. You can't just set up an ambush under the guise of safety. He was a complex character with a complex reign, filled with resistance. The wedge between the royal family and the lords that served them prevented the Seven Kingdoms from flourishing under Aegon V. As he grew older, he started to believe that only dragons can make the more powerful lords truly loyal and obedient once again. This led to a search for reviving dragons that had been extinct for a while now. This caused Egg's death. In an experiment using wildfire to try and hatch some dragon eggs, the Targaryen's vacation castle went up in flames, killing everyone inside. After sitting on the Iron Throne for 26 years, his reign came to an end. He would only be remembered fondly by the small folk who he fought to protect. The surviving son of Aegon would be next to rule. King Jaehaerys II appeared weak to some because of his lack of health, but once he spent some time with the character, most realized he was anything but. He was quick to act even though there wasn't much he could do on the battlefield, but he could lead from afar. He spent much of his short reign reversing some of the newer laws put in place by his father in hopes of reconciling their relationship with his lords. He's remembered a lot more fondly by them, and it didn't come at the cost of the small folk. After only three years on the Iron Throne, his body finally failed him, and Jaehaerys II would die at the age of 37. I consider him to be the last good king to rule over the Seven Kingdoms, and judging by the comments on my last video about the worst kings, a lot of you guys were not happy to see Robert Baratheon on that list, insisting he belonged here. Let me try and tell you why I think that's ridiculous. All Robert did as king was arrange for feasts and tourneys, which actually bankrupted the realm for how frequent he was throwing them. The people were safe and there was peace during his time, yes, but that had nothing to do with him. He was just an obstacle in the way of his hand, Lord John Aaron's work. He was doing all the true ruling. They were also blessed with an absurdly long summer that helped with the crops and quality of life. And to top it all off, something I didn't mention in the previous video, one of the writers who helped with the lore book The World of Ice and Fire came out and said in a blog post that the maester that documented Robert's deeds was biased in order to please the current king, who was Robert Baratheon at the time. The maester couldn't state his flaws like he killed with the Targaryens if he wanted to keep his head, so some propaganda was being spread around. Robert has no place on a list about good kings, regardless of how likable his character is. But if I were to rank the best kings from good to better, it would go Jaehaerys II, Aegon V, then Baelor the Blessed, then Viserys II, Darren the Good, Aegon the Conqueror, and finally Jaehaerys the Conciliator. And of course, this is just so far. There might be more kings to come, but it's not looking good for little Tommen's reign in the books. If you have any opposing opinions, let's hear them. I'm all ears people. 
but I do think there's a lot more gray area here than in my worst list. Thanks for watching guys. I'll be looking forward to reading the comments. See y'all soon.